Well, first of all, studies show that up to 50% of all implant records are incorrect through not having products recorded, incorrect product numbers. The impact on quality of the patient records is significant. Millions of patients undergo surgical procedures every single day. They place their lives in the hands of healthcare providers who are committed to delivering safe, functional and sterile instrumentation for every surgery. Working behind the scenes are the technicians who go largely unknown, even to the patients whose lives are so dramatically impacted by their work. This is Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Join us as we explore this hidden world and introduce you to the unsung heroes who are driving the advancement of our profession. And now your hosts, Justin Fullen, Michael Matthews and Hank Balch. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Phil Sales, founder and president of Summate Technologies. Summate has developed a total solution for digitally managing orthopedic implant trays. Summate's patented marking technology and software enables the first point implant usage scanning at the point of use during surgery and inside the sterile field, automating the implant supply chain. Phil has founded and sold two companies in the clinical diagnostic market, is the author of eight U.S. patents, and spent 15 years as a trauma device rep for Synthes, where he managed a million-dollar territory across three states. This has some parallels, guys, to previous interviews that we've done. Obviously, Kirthi Cannabody's interview with Ready, Set, Surgical touched upon a lot of similarities here, but this has some distinct differences, and we're going to get into that with Phil today on this episode. Really excited to do that. And Mike, I don't know about you, but there's just never enough tracking. No, there really isn't. And, uh, you know, the more you look at it, the more you'll be you know shocked at just how much is done really old school and hasn't really been updated in 20 years. And I can tell you that if you want to see the look of pure terror, look at a, a sterile processing technician's face the first time they ever lay eyes on a Synthi small frag set. Uh, you know, those of us who who have done it for a while, you know, are, are comfortable with it. But, you know, when you've got uh, a department that has really high turnover rates, uh, these new people come in, there's all these screws and plates. I mean, there's so much room for error within that. So I'm really excited to talk to somebody who has some potential answers. You can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher, Google Play and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Also, we have a number of resources to give away this season provided to us by Isham, Amy, CBSPD, Rick Schultz, and Pavel de Sternberg Stoyalovsky. There will be different ways to win every single week, as announced on our various social media sites. So make sure to follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, our Instagram page, Beyond Clean Podcast. And if you have a question or a future guest for the show that you'd like to recommend, send an email to info at beyondclean.net. Season three of Beyond Clean is brought to you by Healthmark and Consortia Surgical. Healthmark has intelligent solutions for your cleaning verification program, including products to measure water temperature, water quality, cleaning efficiency, and directly test for residual soil left on instruments. Find your tools for cleaning verification at hmark.com. There you will learn about their TOSI and SonoCheck that test the performance of cleaning equipment as recommended in sterilization standards guidelines. And Consortia Surgical, the industry's first group service organization with over 100 years of combined experience. They're unmatched experts in the field of flexible and rigid endoscopy, powered surgical handpieces, medical video imaging devices, and surgical instruments and table attachments set them apart as a leader in perioperative equipment management. 
Consortia was created with a primary focus on safety, customer satisfaction, quality repairs, and end-user training, providing their clients with measurable results, improvement, and cost savings. Contact them today at consortiasurgical.com or 844-394-8900. We'll be right back after a short break. Beyond Clean. Joining us now is Phil Sales, founder and president of Summate Technologies. And we've had a few previous guests on the show that have talked about sort of vendor tray management and different aspects of that. But I, we're going to take you to a little bit of a different place with this conversation, and it's about the digitalization of surgical implant management. And I thought, Phil, welcome to the show. Maybe you can kick it off by talking about the scope and the definition of surgical implant management. Sure. Well, I, I thank you for having me on. I worked for 15 years for Synthes, uh as a trauma rep. Basically, what I noticed, I came from other industries. I noticed that the management of the implant supply chain falls to a very manual process of pens, papers, sticky notes, two to three manual input steps at the computer between four to five different people in different areas of the hospital. And what we focused on was developing a new technology, which is based on a modified RFID chip, which can be used to mark trays with a scanner that sterilizes. The entire implant recording process can be now done in the field during surgery and implant usage can be recorded and scanned at point of use in surgery. Digitizing the information then allows the supply chain to be digital all the way through, which leads to great efficiencies. It takes a five to seven manual step process down to one scanned automated accurate step. Phil, you said that, you know, usually it falls under about, you know, five to six different people's hands. You know, who are those five to six different people? What departments do they work for? And who all is involved with managing these surgical implants as it stands right now? It's a great question. Right now, uh, depending upon the facility and the type of device rep support they have, it always starts with the surgical technician in the field. Typically, they have a pen and they're manually recording on the Mayo stand or the back table in the sterile field, what they're using. And that information is then relayed to either a sales rep or a circulating nurse, then manually inputs the information. And then the information is sent down to purchasing, where a person usually manually inputs the information into the computer again. And then the sales rep is quite often tasked with reordering and restocking the trays, where there's another person on the other end of the phone taking an order and processing the order. Depending on the hospital, it can be between five to seven different people in different areas of the hospital. What's the overall market value that we're talking about, right, in this arena? Uh, The implant supply chain is, in the United States, is about a $45 billion market. And there's estimated to be about, uh, numerous studies indicate that there's estimated to be about $5 billion of waste stuck in that supply chain due to all the manual processes. Now, Philip, you know, going back to what you spoke about, all the various teams that are involved in the current workflow today and all the hands that it passes, I'm looking at this, you know, maybe from the implants perspective and thinking, uh, what's the typical life cycle for that particular implant and the documentation that's connected with that in a hospital? And, you know, maybe more importantly, I guess, is... In the current process today, what are the potential risks and the most common breakdowns that happen in this very manual process, as you mentioned, and in a process that touches so many people's hands in and outside of the facility? Well, first of all, studies show that up to 50% of all implant records are incorrect through not having products recorded, incorrect product numbers, the impact on quality of the patient records is significant. When I was a sales rep, I would receive several calls a year from hospitals or from doctor's offices, and they wanted me to come in to try to help them with what implants were actually in the patient. 
whether what brand name they were, what type of screws they were, which is a, it's obviously a quality issue when you have patients and you don't know, you don't have a, a track record or a digital record of what's been implanted in them. The other area that's really impacted is the inventory on the trays or the inventory in the back stock typically has a lot of outdated implants that are non-turning within the system. So it's cost for the hospital that sits on their books that at the end of the day, non-rotating assets, which are very expensive, is, is a huge cost burden for hospitals. Yeah, I'll say as a former director and now as a consultant, I've been in numerous hospitals where on the consignment side of things, if you were to go down into the serial processing department and ask the leader, you know, what's the value of the implants here? Or, you know, what is the inventory of the implants here? Unfortunately, that uh, can't always give a clear answer as a sterile processing leader, and it often comes back to this complex, incorrect process that you just mentioned. And, you know, historically, again, these departments and leaders have not had the tools to keep track of this, or even, you know, to have that open line of communication between supply chain and the OR and a rep in the room, for instance. So all that to say, you know, knowing the potential risks then and knowing the percentages of incorrectly documented implant records, how then today can technology or has technology been used to streamline this process? And I guess, you know, why is that important? Well, if you look at most hospitals, at least for trauma implants, the trays and orthopedic sets themselves often have implants that are consigned to the hospital. The backstock, which is used to replenish the sets, is often what's bought by the hospital. So the device company will consign the trays, and then the rep will work on building the inventory so that they to ensure that they don't run out of implants, but often that's paid for by the hospital. So if you go into a hospital and they have a lot of non-rotating backup or excess inventory, that's often paid for by the hospital, which is a tremendous cost burden on their books. You know, it's funny that you say that, Phil, because my next question was to ask you, you know, how much do the vendor companies appreciate being able to get a better handle on this? Because we've heard about dead stock sitting in trunks and all of that and being unaccounted for with loaner trays. But it sounds like what you're saying here, and I think I heard you correctly, is that the hospital's already paid for it. So it truly is dead stock and waste. Well, not maybe dead stock. It might get used, but it's not rotating. It could be and could lead to dead stock that the hospital is sitting and already paid for and may never get used. That's correct. And with updated product coming out and new trays being consigned to the hospital, that back stock is often not rotated or turned in for credit, which is, again, it's another cost burden for the hospitals, which they don't realize any value for. So the hospitals can get money back, even if they've already paid for it. If they decide to go with a new module, they can take some of this old stock and get money back on it. I'm assuming they don't get full credit, but maybe not everybody realizes that they can return that stock if they're managing it effectively. Typically, yes, that's correct. And to maintain good customer relations, most orthopedic companies will allow the hospitals to turn in old back stock for a credit, usually with the restock fee between 10 to 20%. The back stock is traced to purchases. And then a dollar amount is generated, which can be used to buy new implants or replenish the backstock of the new implants that they're using in the the newer trades. So we've talked about several of the potential risks involved with, you know, this poorly maintained stock. You know, I know from experience in management that oftentimes we would have reps come in, they would just bring us sets of screwdrivers in for a, a implant removal case and we would ask them why you need so many screwdrivers and they would say because we don't know whose screw is in there. So they're basically guessing at a lot of stuff and that all comes back to, you know, that those poor records. And then of course like we just talked about, the money involved is sometimes very staggering. How can technology be used to streamline that implant management process? Sure. Well, the the gold standard of supply chain management is scanning at point of use. It's used from 
pretty much every industry you can imagine. It's used from Amazon to Kroger's to Walmart. And by digitizing the usage information up front, it's not only more accurate, but it also takes that supply chain from numerous manual steps to one automated step. The benefits to both the device companies and to the hospitals are basically inarguable. The problem is, is that the hospital OR has been relying on optical scanning technology or trying to implement optical scanning technology. The downfall there is that optical marks lose their contrast and get compromised through numerous reprocessing cycles. So barcodes, whether they're put on stickers or they're laser etched or they are direct part marked, often after 40 or 50 or 60 cycles stop working. The other problem is that they're put on highly reflective surfaces often that have trouble reading the bright lights of the OR. They have trouble picking up the optical signal. So our technology is a little different in that it's short field RFID and they can be used to mark the trays and instruments as well so that they can be scanned much more reliably. So just to clarify for the audience, when you say optical scanning, you know, that may be obvious, but you're talking like you reference barcodes, the data matrix codes, anything that it can be seen in addition to be scanned, I guess, right? Well, yeah. So basically what those technologies are doing is optical scanning needs your that reader is literally taking a picture of the 2D barcodes, which is what is commonly used. And in taking the picture, you need contrast. And what happens is the marks fade. The Anything that's a surgical asset is exposed to heat, steam, abrasion, and a very harsh environment where the contrast between the black and the white, the binary digital information that's in the mark, becomes compromised over time. And so anytime that we talk about technology, and I, I know I don't have to tell you this, but anytime that word comes up in conversation, especially if it's a new technology such as what you're talking about today, is there's a certain percentage of the world that just immediately recoils in fear. And I don't know <laughs> if we have a higher percentage of those in healthcare or not, you know, but that automatically creates a barrier. I'm wondering, if, is it just a personality issue that creates barriers for adopting these types of new technologies to improve the process, or do you see it rooted elsewhere? I think it's primarily rooted in the fact that in healthcare, there's a high degree of risk aversion just by the basis of what people are doing in the, in the operative environment. So I think that's, that's one factor that leads to a lack of adoption. But I also think that it's also what I call the mailroom phenomena, which is basically they're so busy and they've got so little time to stop and think and plan that it becomes very, very difficult for the operative environment to adopt change. The other, the other problem is that the operative environment is typically run by clinically oriented people. It's a siloed sort of walled off environment where a lot of times best business practices find it difficult to reach that environment. It's behind closed doors and the people that run, run the environment are clinically oriented. So think processes and business practices that you find in the rest of the hospital, such as pharmacy, such as central supply where scanning is ubiquitous, are less prevalent in the operating room just by the very very walled off sealed environment that exists there that's insightful and and i mean really any of those areas you know the or and sterile processing anything that's behind that red line it does become more difficult just you know to physically get to those folks but then also as you mentioned you know the siloed communication and as all of our listeners know, that's one of the primary reasons that we started the Beyond Clean podcast is to start getting over those walls, if you will, or you know, through the window, whatever it is, to get information and, and conversation going. So I totally agree that that's probably one of the factors here, slowing down that conversion process. But I know you mentioned earlier that the technology in particular that you're speaking on it is not a classic RFID technology and even though that technology, we did an episode here recently talking about RFID into the OR 
in instrument space. One of the barriers with that is a big upfront capital investment. You've got to have readers in order for all of this to work. And I know you mentioned that with your technology, there's a scanner that's able to be sterilized. But what other aspects would go into making something like your technology work or other technologies in this space in terms of capital investment to actually get it off the ground and going? So so one of the areas we've been keenly focused on is developing a return on investment or ROI calculator for the hospital, which is something that can be driven from the CFO or C-level suite downward. One of the challenges that face any type of systems technology that goes into a hospital is that it touches upon a lot of different departments. So when you're talking about software and scanning in the operating room, it not only is used in the operating room, you have IT involved, you have several processing involved, you have nursing involved. So it's a factor that leads to a difficult sales process. That combined with the urgency of just making sure the cases go make the sales cycle on this challenging. So we've developed an ROI calculator that will appeal to the hospital at the CFO level where we can show that there is a clear return on investment through efficiency on scanning at point of use for the hospital to gain. This makes it easier for the hospital to get all the disparate departments that this touches involved in the process. Now, you mentioned previously that you had come out of the medical device rep world uh, yourself, but just kind of hearing this entire conversation and all the impact that it's going to have in the OR room, also down into the sterile processing space, is technology like this, is it feeding into that conversation or maybe the temptation, if you will, to transition to a repless model in the OR, or is it just another tool to make that process more efficient? Where does that come down in terms of the device rep themselves? So so that's a great question. And you've got a problem in the OR in that the surgeons quite often want the rep there because the rep can provide them information and fix problems and answer questions for the surgeon. Although on routine cases, in my experience, the rep is usually not, not always necessary. And the rep can be just someone that helps to record things, and even change the radio. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but for routine cases, there's absolutely no, no need to have a representative in the room. But I think that the surgeons look at the ref as a crutch, and I understand why, because the surgeon is relatively helpless in the field. So having that extra resource there is in an emergency or something comes up that they're not expecting can be very, very helpful. However, as the hospital adapts new tools, learns to utilize technology, I I think the reps are going to become less and less prevalent in the OR. Research shows that reps add about 20% to an implant case, and I don't think this is a cost that hospitals want to carry. Phil, we've talked a lot about the OR's role in scanning uh, at the point of use, can you elaborate for us what SPD's role would be then with the management system? Sure. Well, well, a supply chain as a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So one of the key features is obviously scanning at point of use during surgery, which alleviates some of the pressure on the circulating nurse to get the implants into the system when she's got a lot of other tasks to complete. The other key piece to this is sterile processing. And When the usage information on the implants is digitized, it can be used down in sterile processing attached to that tray so that sterile processing, when they go to inventory the tray, if they're in fact doing it and doing the restocking, they can look at the record of the surgical case and have a much better, more accurate view to what was used in the case for restocking. We've done some initial studies which show that it can take doing a tray restock for hospitals that actually do it from about an hour down to about 10 minutes. Yeah, that's uh, that's terrific. There's a lot of trail processing technicians out there who are clapping their hands because I have done those trays, especially if it's a newer tray or a larger tray that you're not familiar with. It can be a, a very long process to go through and identify. And I was in a facility not too long ago where they had issues at either the restock in their cabinet was in the correct slot 
or the screws in the caddy were in the incorrect slot the previous time, and there was just no way to even go back and figure out where did this go wrong besides just realizing now, oh, this has been wrong. How long has it been wrong? And did we even document this particular screw appropriately because it wasn't the screw that the caddy said that it was supposed to be uh, to top it off, you know? So, yeah, there's uh, that lack of transparency even for sterile processing puts us behind the eight ball to even do a good job. It is easy for us, like you said, to become a weak link in that process, but not even it's not our fault. We just don't have the tools to do it. Absolutely. No, I, I agree 100 percent, Hang. And that, that's part of the reason why I developed the technology with some of my my coworkers was to solve this problem. When the trays come out and they come out of the washer and they come to the bench, the technician, all the technician has to do is scan the tray and then it's a touch screen interface, just touch the implant list and they can see and print out a full list of what implants were used with descriptions, with part numbers, so they could go to a backstock bin and accurately pull the, the implants that were used and quickly and accurately restock the tray. Wow. I'd love to do a demo for you guys, an online software demo. So we've been talking in this interview, obviously, about a new technology that's moving out of the manual into the digitized space, but I want to ask you here before we start to wrap is, What's next? You know, you have, have moved the football down the field a number of yards, you know, but there's obviously still further to go. Can you speak to maybe the other technology that's going on in the industry that we know is going to be the next step, but we're not there yet? You know, what's shaking out there? So one of the key points here is that I think for industry adoption, not only the hospitals and healthcare providers are going to have to get behind this. But I think the implant companies themselves are entering into a more collaborative phase with hospitals where hospitals are are seen as partners, less just customers. So I think the companies that will move first and adopt this technology will be seen by the hospital as true partners and bringing them a solution that helps them do their jobs more completely and not only saving money, but from an accuracy standpoint. So our initial goal is to, we have two or three trials right now going at hospitals here in the Northeast, but we look forward to working with the implant companies and developing this as a standard so that when trays come in on loaners, they're ready to be scanned. And I think that's going to be an important part of this is to have the device industry adopt and get behind it in the light of trying to be partners with the hospital as opposed to just sort of a more adversarial, traditional adversarial role, a partner to help the hospitals do their job better and improve health care. Phil, that's really great stuff. I mean, this is obviously something that needs to be addressed. When we talk about all the waste that's in healthcare financially, you know, really getting a handle on it and streamlining it so that the cost to reduce the waste for manpower's sake isn't so high that people don't take the initiative. So really sounds like you've got something here that's going to help hospitals really save some money. And I do like where you're going with the partnership. There's been a lot of emphasis on this repless model. I'm not sure the whole Totally repless model will ever work completely, but it certainly will be much more trustworthy when you have that partner relationship versus fox and the hen house type relationship that a lot of people in purchasing and supply chain sort of view it as. So thank you so much for sharing your insights on the show today. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time as well. Thank you. That was Phil Sales, founder and president of Summate Technologies. Hank, you know, this whole repless model that's been floated out there. Recently, there was an article on NPR. And then also, if you were listening to NPR, there was a piece on audio as well on the radio. And I think our friend Sean Flynn mentioned it or posted it. I know it made its rounds on LinkedIn. It's definitely very interesting. And and I don't really see it happening, but I do like what we heard from Phil just in terms of more collaboration, more partnership, more visibility, and we need these cost controls in healthcare so we can spend the money more wisely. 
No, that's true, Justin. And, and, you know, having been a leader in sterile processing and dealt with reps from that angle, not in the OR, you know, but what happens after the OR, what happens before, we deal with a lot of reps in that space as well. And I can understand the argument for the repless model in the OR, but without any other tools, it makes me very hesitant to say, well, all the reps are going to go away. Who's going to tell us what goes back in this tray or what's wrong with this tray? And that's where I really believe this kind of technology that Phil discussed can get us there, and not in a in a rep free zone, but in a less dependent space on that rep knowledge that we could have the knowledge and tools to do our jobs effectively. And, and I think everyone agrees that that's where we need to go as an industry. Yeah, you definitely do. And think about how many times that rep is coming in on weird hours, and just the, how odd that can be for their lifestyle you know that was always like when you're doing that job you know that person's working hard because they may be the only one who has the information that they can bring to the table this would also give more people the ability to solve a solution or be able to manage inventory at least and empower the hospitals to be essentially fully staffed and ready at any given time That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes or Stitcher and now also on Google Play and Spotify. Simply search for Beyond Clean Podcast. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us here on the show. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.